So now we're back into the land of computers and technology. We want to understand how sea ice, changes in sea ice, affects climate. So we've returned to the National Renewable Energy Laboratories where we're looking at photovoltaic cells. Photovoltaic cells take the sun's energy and convert it into electricity. The light energy comes in what's called photons, and those little packages of light will strike the semiconductor, which is the material that the solar cell is made of. When the photon, or the light particle, hits the semiconductor, it knocks away an electron. An electron is what electricity is made of. One electron gets knocked off. By the way the solar cell is designed, that electron then goes into a wire or some other way of moving it away from the solar cell. It moves down that wire. We use it to do some work, say light a light bulb, run a motor, and then we return it back to the solar cell where it wants to go fill in the hole that it left when it was knocked away. And we're working in two directions. One is to make these cells more efficient so that they convert more of the sunlight that hits them into electricity. The other is to reduce the cost of making the cells or of manufacturing the cells. If we can make cells more efficient and make them cheap, more cheaply, then the cost of energy comes down and we'll have cost of energy that's comparable to other forms of energy. The sun's energy is really important to consider when you're thinking about climate change on Earth. The more that the Earth reflects the sun's energy off into space, the cooler the planet stays. So if the Earth is covered with snow and ice, it stays cool. If that snow and ice melts, the planet warms. The melting of sea ice has been making news recently in that seals are losing breeding grounds and polar bears are losing feeding grounds. Right now we're going to go talk to Dr. Andrew Mahoney, who had an adventure out on sea ice in Greenland. Greenland is one of the three communities um, in a, a larger project where we're comparing the relationship between people in those communities and the sea ice. And so we're looking at how in the three different communities around the Arctic, we've got one in Alaska, we have one in northern Canada, and we have Karnak in Greenland. Um, we're looking at how the people there relate to sea ice, the different uses that they have for sea ice. Um, and then we're also looking at how the sea ice is changing in those three different areas. In the places like northern Canada and Greenland where you have very mountainous terrain, the sea ice is the easiest surface to travel upon. Um, it offers a level surface that you can ride your snow machine or your dog team across um, to get to hunting grounds. Marine mammals such as the polar bear and um, seals also use sea ice um, to hunt on and to, to breed on and to give birth on. And so naturally that's where these mammals are going to be found and so that's where people are going to go. People are going to go to hunt these animals. Our group of researchers met with um, people from town who are interested in our project and also wanted to participate in our project. Um, we told them we wanted to see the CS that they use on a daily basis. We asked them if there had been any changes they've seen recently. Um, and we said, well, if we were going to go on a trip and we wanted to see some of these things, where would you recommend that we go? So they suggested that we went to Siorapaluk, which is the northernmost community in the world. So we rented some dog sled drivers, and uh, with six teams of us, we set out across the sea ice, um, traveling mostly along the coast, trying to stick to the most level ice that we could. On the way, they were telling us, pointing out hunting grounds that they use. They took us to some of their hunting cabins. Um, but about halfway along, the conditions really deteriorated, and we, we got into um, whiteout conditions where we really couldn't see very far ahead of us. And it was at that time that um, I was in one of the sleds that, the, that, that, that was leading the trip. Um, our sled dog driver noticed that there were water marks in the footprints of the dogs. And that meant that we were on very, very thin ice. And we were traveling in March, which is pretty much considered the middle of winter, some of the coldest months of the year. Um, and the ice isn't normally thin enough to leave uh, wet footprints. Um, and also, the area of open ice was much bigger than people would consider usual for that time of year. Luckily, we all made it to Sierrapaluk safely, 
And on our return journey in much clearer weather, we could see the route that we had taken the day before and the proper detour that we should have taken. And in fact, there was some completely open water that we saw um, a seal swimming in. It's, it's those kind of marginal traveling conditions that are becoming increasingly dangerous now for, for the people up there. It makes a routine trip into something quite hazardous. So now we're back into the land of computers and technology. We want to understand how sea ice, changes in sea ice, affects climate. We also want to know how scientists are monitoring sea ice today and estimating how sea ice is going to change in the future. Well, one of the things I'm very interested in is uh, the declining Arctic sea ice cover. This is the floating sea ice cover that covers much of the Arctic Ocean. What we've seen um, from our satellite data is that it's in the midst of a long-term decline. Uh, it may be in 50 years from now that sea ice will be completely gone in the summer season. So it really is kind of the early warning indicator that changes are happening. If we start to radically change the Arctic, what we're going to see is responses in things like the circulation of the atmosphere. We lose that sea ice, that starts to do things like influence storm tracks, patterns of precipitation in middle latitudes. Now we know that snow and sea ice that covers much of the Arctic is very white. Uh, that means that most of the sun's energy that hits that surface is bounced right back up into space. It helps keep the Arctic cool. But what happens if we warm up the system and start to melt a little bit of that snow and ice cover? Well, now the surface starts to become a little darker. We start to expose areas of bare ground, areas of open ocean, which have a much lower albedo or reflectivity. That means that those areas now start to absorb more of the sun's energy than they did before. But if they absorb more of the sun's energy, that means the system heats up a little more because you're absorbing more energy, melts more of the snow and ice, causes further warming. So it's a system, it's a, it's a situation that perpetuates itself, sort of a vicious cycle, if you will. Well, the way we study sea ice is uh, we, can, we can look at that sea ice from space, uh, from the satellites that are in orbit around the Earth. Uh, these provide us with very good records of what the sea ice is doing. Right? Now, we have good records of sea ice from satellites that go back to the late 1970s. We have other ways of extending those records back to about the early 1950s, based on earlier satellite data, aircraft ship reports, things like this. So we have a good observational record of sea ice cover for probably about 50 years now. So we can really start to get an idea of these longer term changes. It seems that this rapid, this recent change certainly is quite rapid and quite large. It seems rather inescapable at this point to argue against the notion that we're starting to see the effects of human activities in the Arctic. But we also look at climate models. These are these complex numerical representations of the climate system. To make these, to have them reproduce the observed temperature change, we have to give these climate models our best estimates of the climate forcings. This is things like oh, volcanic eruptions, for example. It's a natural climate forcing solar variability, but also atmospheric greenhouse gases. We can do experiments with these models, and if we, for example, do not add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, you can't reproduce the observed 20th century temperature change. You add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that we observe, the observed rates of change, we can indeed reproduce the climate of the 20th century. Complicated climate models take into account the interactions between the atmosphere, the oceans, and the land. They're perfect for testing different variables, such as carbon dioxide. And we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. So if we increase carbon dioxide, this causes global warming to occur. Global warming will melt permafrost, releasing more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, causing more global warming. Likewise, the global warming is going to melt sea ice. The recession of sea ice is going to have more radiant energy from the sun absorbed onto the planet, causing more global warming to occur. So global warming causes more global warming to occur. 
Right now we're gonna go talk to a climate modeler about some of her results or some of her predictions about what's gonna happen to sea ice in the future. So I use climate models and I also help develop aspects of climate models to look at polar climate and how we think it's gonna change in the future, how it's changed in the past. Um, I specifically work on the sea ice components in these models. Sea ice plays a really important role in the, in the global climate system uh, because it's very bright, it's, it's highly reflective, so a lot of sunlight bounces off the ice surface so that as you lose sea ice, you absorb more heat in the system, more sunlight in the system, that causes further melting of the sea ice. Uh, so this shows the September extent, so that's the aerial coverage of ice in September from 1900 to the year 2000 here. And this black line um, with the blue line running through it, that's our climate model simulation. So in these climate models, we, we um, simulate what's happened over the last century to give us some idea of how well the climate model is representing the real system. So here's Greenland, this is the North Atlantic Ocean here. Um, the different colors represent how much ice cover there is. So there's always open ocean showing through the sea ice in cracks and, and breaks in the ice cover. Um, so these blue and green colors are where we see um, less ice coverage, more of the open ocean peeking through. The, the red, um, warm colors are where we have essentially complete ice coverage. What we see is reductions in sea ice that are quite similar to what we've observed over the last 10 years or so. But then in this model run, the ice stabilizes at a reduced um, level uh, shown here, where we have less concentrated ice, so more of the open ocean peeking through. We also have a general reduction in the extent of the ice. The sea ice in this model run stabilizes at these kind of conditions for about 20, 25 years. Then, however, it undergoes this incredibly rapid um, retreat. Going from conditions such as shown here to near ice-free conditions where now you hardly see any ice cover left in the Arctic. Uh, the Antarctic is a, is a very different place from the Arctic. Um, and the sea ice is a very different animal. So you have this very large amplitude annual cycle in the um, southern hemisphere sea ice where the winter sea ice is quite large and extensive but most of that melts away in the summer and you only have a little bit of ice remaining um, right along the Antarctic continent in summer. So um, whereas in the Arctic which is an ocean surrounded by land you have sea ice year-round and you have quite thick sea ice year-round. 